This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome visitors and church family. It is a joy to be with you today. You know, I really felt it on my heart to remind you that God says, I am the Lord that heals you. I am the Lord that heals you. If you need healing today, take him for his word. You are loved. And of course, all of us are going through various things and what a you know, difficult time and, and trying time for our country and for so many mm -hmm. people today. It's already been tough because of coronavirus and economic woes and all of these things. So today we're gonna take some time to just be together, to love each other, to rest, to relax, and to just receive from the Holy Spirit the, the word that we need from him today. He's got a word for you and I believe it's gonna touch your heart and it's gonna lead you to wherever you need to go this morning or this evening, wherever you're watching. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for all that you've given to us. We are so grateful for your Holy Spirit and we're thankful for the cross. Thank you, Lord, that we can come before your throne boldly as beloved sons and daughters. We pray, God, that today would be a new day, a fresh day for our families, our friends, our countries. Lord, we thank you so much for all you've given us and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I.
In preparation for the message, Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Lord, help us to fully embody these commandments in your powerful name. Amen. Hannah and I are so happy that you've joined us in worship today, and we hope that you found incredible hope and inspiration from this program. Several years ago, I began practicing the Creed of the Beloved by saying it aloud each day, and now it's become a vital part of the walk that I have with the Lord. Though simple, these words have changed me from the inside out and given me renewed vision, joy, and energy. Every week on Our Power, we recite the Creed, which says, I'm not what I do, I'm not what I have, I'm not what people say about me, 
I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it away from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. And that's the truth, dear friend. By resting in the Lord's boundless and unconditional love, you will experience the fullness of his blessings. When you embrace your position as his beloved child, you will be empowered to step into your true identity, to be courageous, to take risks, and to follow his call on your life. Though it's not magic, practicing this creed changed the dial on my life one degree at a time. Well, I didn't notice like a huge difference at first, as I regularly trained and aligned my mind with the Word of God, I developed a deep sense of rootedness and contentment. And I believe this can happen to you too. As a daily reminder of who you are in Christ, we want to send you this Creed of the Beloved bookmark. As you meditate on the truths it contains, we believe it has the potential to transform your life from the inside out. Write to Hour of Power, New Zealand, P.O. Box 26209, Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. You can tap into the energy, power, and joy that comes from living in the kingdom of God when you walk every day in your identity as His beloved. As always, we're extremely grateful for your friendship and we're continually praying for you. God loves you and so do we. Dr. Hugh Ross is an astrophysicist who founded the organization Reasons to Believe, which researches scientific discoveries and provides evidence to prove creation, Christianity, and God's existence. Well, there's this perception within the church that you can't reconcile science with what the Bible teaches. The organization showcases that science and a biblical faith can intertwine and work together cohesively. Dr. Ross has shared his findings in a number of books, as well as news articles and podcasts. He's also a teacher at A.W. Tozer Seminary and Southern Evangelical Seminary. Please welcome Dr. Hugh Ross. Dr. Ross, hi, welcome. What a joy it is to have you virtually with us this morning, and I wish you could be here in person, but of course you've got a lot of fans in the house and on television. It's, it's such a joy to have you with us. Thank you. Well, um, I know of, uh, most of us, I think, here are familiar with your work, but um, for those who haven't heard it, can you tell us a little bit about your story and sort of how you came to this place of both being a scientist and being, I mean, I would think of sort of a, a teacher, you know, Christian teacher. Yeah, well, I was born, raised, and educated in Canada. Didn't really get to know Christians until I showed up at Caltech at age 27. But I started studying astronomy, uh, reading four or five books a week from the age of seven onwards. I knew from age eight onwards that I would become an astrophysicist. And it was my research and study in astronomy that persuaded me the universe must have a beginning. If there's a beginning, there must be a cosmic beginner. So at age 17, I went on a quest to find that cosmic beginner. I first looked for him in the writings of the great philosophers, discovered they had the wrong concepts of the universe, and then I began to go through the world's holy books. And when I tell people I really didn't get to know Christians until I was 27, I did see two from 30 feet away when I was 11 years of age. And these were two businessmen that came into a public school and put two boxes on our teacher's desk. But in those boxes were Gideon Bibles. So I began to go through my Gideon Bible starting at age 17, uh, spending about an hour or two a day, uh, you know, kind of going through it, putting it to the test, discovered how different it was from the other holy books, actually predicted future scientific discoveries and the future historical events. I was especially impressed that it predicted all the features of Big Bang cosmology thousands of years before astronomers had a clue that this was the correct description of the universe. Uh, at age 19, I became convinced uh, that this uh, book, the Bible, uh, was the inspired and errant word of God and wound up signing my name in the back of the Gideon Bible, giving my life to Jesus Christ 
this is the very Bible that I signed my name in uh, way back then. And uh, having spent two years uh, fine tooth combing the Bible, I realize giving your life to Jesus Christ is making a commitment to publicly demonstrate that Jesus is the most important person in your life. So I began to look for people that I could share my Christian faith with, uh, starting with my physics lab partner, and uh, went on to share my faith with uh, colleagues at the University of Toronto. And when I arrived at Caltech, that's where I really met serious Christians for the first time. And they said, Hugh, uh, it's great that you're leading these astrophysicists to Christ. And uh, that had happened. Several atheists had come to Christ. But they said, have you ever thought about sharing your faith with non-scientists? I said, well, where do you find these non-scientists? They said, well, walk <laughs> off the Caltech campus. And I literally did that. I walked off the campus, just started talking to people in the street, and discovered that they were far more receptive uh, to the scientific evidence that the Bible is the Word of God. And that led me into a full-time ministry of using the book of nature that God has given us to bring people to the book of Scripture and to bring them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is a danger, isn't it, in the academic circles, especially with professors and grad students and pre-doc and post-doc students. You have this sort of arrogance that's kind of like, I know everything. I know I was that way when I was in my 20s, when I was in grad school. I thought I was the smartest guy ever until I got in a room, of course, full of people that were a lot smarter than I was. But it, it, that's a hard barrier, I think, to break from a, you know, sharing your faith uh, standpoint. I, one thing I, I think as a fan of history that I think is so interesting is how the church and science oftentimes have been at odds. You know, you think of um, things like theories about how the solar system worked was at odds with Christian theology, for example, in the medieval world. And yet many Christians and churches have been at the heart of building these universities. Like Harvard was, a, I think, was established to train missionaries. And and Isaac Newton wrote a systematic theology. So there, there's certainly been a, a background. Why do you think, I guess the question I'm getting at is, is um, wh why do you think so many leaders in the scientific community want to draw this line for people now? I feel like more than ever where it's like, you can't be a serious Christian and be a serious scientist. Well, I get that all the time when I attend scientific meetings. They say, you know, uh, it's obvious that the Bible is scientifically flawed. I said, well, who told you that? <laughs> I found out that they typically didn't even open the book up. I says, well, look at the Bible, follow the biblical testing method. It's no accident that the scientific revolution and the scientific method exploded out of Reformation Europe. And they're stunned to discover that the scientific method is actually in the pages of Scripture. And if you follow that, you will come up with a more accurate interpretation of the Bible, and it's a perfect fit with the established scientific record. I mean, that's how I actually engage my fellow uh, scientists and to bring them to Christ. But you have to be patient. Scientists, I mean, it took me two years. And so I, I actually give these scientists the opportunity, put it to the test. Go at it step by step, ask questions, and I want them to be totally confident that indeed this book is the inspired and errant word of God, completely compatible with the record of nature. That's awesome. I, one thing, uh, Dr. Ross, I, I really enjoy is your heart to lead people to the Lord. And that's something, you know, we're a very missional church, and we, we want to see people who feel like, you know, church could never be a place for me. We want to show them that, that the house of God is the best place for people like whoever you are. And, and uh, I love that in this book, Always Be Ready, you're encouraging people how to share their faith. Um, and I think that's so important. Well, Dr. Ross, thank you so much and for encouraging us. I totally believe in those divine appointments to encourage people and to share your faith and pray with people. And I'm so grateful you're encouraging people to do that. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to encourage you, if you're at home, to get a copy of this book, especially if you have someone in your life from the scientific community that you want to share your faith with. Dr. Ross, thank you so much. God bless you. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you. I'm not
Anna and I are so happy that you've joined us in worship today, and we hope that you found incredible hope and inspiration from this program. Several years ago, I began practicing the Creed of the Beloved by saying it aloud each day, and now it's become a vital part of the walk that I have with the Lord. Though simple, these words have changed me from the inside out and given me renewed vision, joy, and energy. Every week on Our Power, we recite the Creed, which says, I'm not what I do, I'm not what I have, I'm not what people say about me, I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it away from me. I don't have to worry, I don't have to hurry, I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. And that's the truth, dear friend. By resting in the Lord's boundless and unconditional love, you will experience the fullness of his blessings. When you embrace your position as his beloved child, you will be empowered to step into your true identity, to be courageous, to take risks, and to follow his call on your life. Though it's not magic, practicing this creed changed the dial on my life one degree at a time. While I didn't notice like a huge difference at first, as I regularly trained and aligned my mind with the Word of God, I developed a deep sense of rootedness and contentment. And I believe this can happen to you too. As a daily reminder of who you are in Christ, we want to send you this Creed of the Beloved bookmark. As you meditate on the truths it contains, we believe it has the potential to transform your life from the inside out. Write to Hour of Power New Zealand, P.O. Box 26209 Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. You can tap into the energy, power, and joy that comes from living in the kingdom of God when you walk every day in your identity as His beloved. As always, we're extremely grateful for your friendship and we're continually praying for you. God loves you and so do we. Well, whoever you are, would you stand with me today? Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. We're going to say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. Well, today we're continuing the second part of our series on Lead Like Jesus. The messages in this thing are going to sound a little corporate sometimes, which I can feel kind of uncomfortable with. And I won't get into as much of history and a lot of those things that we like, but I think there's, there's some other stuff that I think is valuable uh, to be found when we learn what it means to lead and influence others, not in the way that the world teaches us, but in the way that the Lord teaches us, that we are taught to be more like servants than like emperors, and that in God's kingdom, when we lead in order to serve, when we lead in order to protect, to bless, to encourage, to share a faith, to, that, that we actually find that that's the best way to lead. And so we talked about that last week. We talked about the heart of Jesus and what it means to lead in that way. But today we're going to talk about the head of Jesus. In other words, what, it, what is the philosophy of leadership that Rabbi Jesus was teaching his disciples and what we can learn from that in terms of our own leadership? Again, I want to remind you that you are a leader. You think, I don't have any followers. Well, of course you do. Anytime you try to give influence to your spouse, if you're married, you're a leader. If you've got kids, you're a leader. If you're sitting in the pew right now, you're a leader. No matter what, where you are, what you're doing, you, if you ever speak, if you ever respond, if you ever react to people, you are in small ways and big ways influencing, and that makes you a leader. And the more you influence, the more you're sort of seen as a leader. So I want you to think of yourself as a leader and think about the way that you lead as having, uh, you know, a philosophy or as having, you know, something to it where you think I got to lead the right way. Okay. 
So the first thing you recognize that makes Jesus different as a leader than the more you know, notable leaders of history, Alexander the Great, Caesar, various presidents and others that we think are these great leaders, is that Jesus himself really didn't really do much outside of his little circle. In other words, um, Jesus didn't travel probably more than 30 miles from the place he was born. Jesus was probably not wealthy. Jesus never actually wrote anything down himself. Uh, he never built anything. Well, he would have been a builder, so he would have built stuff for other people. But he himself never built anything, you know. He never built a synagogue with his name on it or something. And Jesus personally never toppled any kingdoms or led any revolutions against any governments. And yet you can see that the after effects of Jesus' life and ministry led to the writing of some of the greatest books in history, including the Bible, led to some of the biggest crowds that have ever, ever gathered. We've seen millions of people gather in churches and places like Africa, even today. He never built a building, but some of the greatest cathedrals and churches and government buildings and universities were built because of him. And I can make the historic argument, I don't have time today, that Christianity toppled the Roman Empire and toppled many other, uh, you know, bad empires and things like that. So my point is, when we look at Christ, we can see that if you never leave your hometown, and if you never write a book, and if you never build a building, and if you never have giant crowds, you can be the most influential leader in history. There is something to learn from this. That if you want to have a true impact, you need to look at the way Jesus led. And one of the first things you see is what Harry Truman said, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. Okay, when I look at the biggest difference between Jesus' leadership style and most of the great leaders of history, I see lots of things, but the biggest thing that stands out that I'm going to really harp on today that you need to get if you leave here is that although vision is important and a mission statement is important and where you're going is important, the most important thing to any family that you want to thrive, any business, any church or organization, anything, is its culture. Its culture, its values. It, the culture is greater than the vision. Okay? This is where you need to have an impact first if you want to have the philosophy of Christ in your work. Or as Dallas Willard says, Christ cares more about cr big Christians than he does about having big churches. So what you see from the Lord is that even though there's big crowds that follow him, he doesn't seem to like th those crowds. He invests in 12 disciples and then maybe a broader group of 70 disciples. He's constantly using the challenges that they face to grow them as people. He's constantly using their situation to show them how they can understand God in a fuller and deeper way. And so Christ is all about building the kind of people that will change the world rather than being the guy that changes the world directly. I've seen this, you know, in lots of different ways, but like in the church, you have seen many leaders who lead like the world and many leaders who lead like Christ. So one of the best examples, I wonder if you knew him, Tim, is Chuck Smith. I don't even really know what Chuck Smith looks like, actually. I think I do. But you look at the legacy of Chuck Smith from the Jesus movement. In the, did you know him, though, by the way? So it started here in Costa Mesa, where I live. I live in Costa Mesa. Chuck Smith, in the 60s and 70s, and the Jesus movement, had just an incredible, profound impact on the world. There are now thousands of Calvary Chapel churches all over the world that exist because of this guy's culture and leadership, but he didn't make it about himself. Whereas many of his contemporaries had incredible ministries, incredible buildings and influence, but after they passed away, most of their influence went away too. So for you, I, I just want to say, first of all, that God... These big questions that we ask in life, the philosophy of God changing and doing things in your life is that God cares more 
about building you into the right kind of person, or maybe I should say it this way. First, God wants to change who you are before changing your circumstance. He wants to change who you can become. He wants to make you stronger, smarter, more loving, more joyful before putting you in the situations where you're going to see a lot of these big dreams and goals in your life accomplished. Okay, let's keep going. So this is something I learned. This idea of culture is more important than the vision. This is something that I learned on many of our missionary trips. We did, Hannah and I have done multiple missionary humani humanitarian international trips around the world. We did this before. We actually met in Panama. And we did these things uh, multiple times. Here's a picture of me in Nepal. This is my last missions trip. I was 25 years old with a half beard and long hair. What a good looking guy. I'm talking about my brother-in-law, the guy standing behind me. And behind him is a guy named Chris Frantum. This bridge, can I, can I just step back for a minute? This is in Nepal. This bridge is several hundred feet long, made of steel. It's coming from a place in the middle of the Himalayas, not too far from Everest, actually, called the Last Resort. That's the word play. I don't know if I've told you guys the story. I, I probably don't have time, but I don't care. I'm just going to tell it anyway. It has nothing to do with my sermon. We, <laughs> one of the greatest things about missionary trips is chaos. That you teach people that the best way to be in life is someone who thrives in a chaotic environment. And this particular day was one of the most important days of my life. It was the first day we could see in Kathmandu, you could actually see Everest which was over 100 miles away. I didn't think that was possible because of the curvature of the earth. But in this case, the, clear, the sky was clear enough after some rain that you could actually see Everest way off. There was an Australian guy who was there with me. I'll still never forget what he said. He's like, Bobby, there's two types of places. There's coffee places and there's tea places. Nepal's a tea place. You're not going to get any coffee here, my friend. I was like kind of bummed about that. Sorry to all the Australians for that very terrible attempt at an Australian accent. But uh, we saw Everest, and when we went out, we had this whole thing where we had this tiny little van full of 15 missionaries. The Maoists in Nepal had taken over the government, overthrown the government while we were there. And so there were a bunch of communist college students who were shutting things down. They did this shelter-in-place thing, not like we do, but where it's called a travel ban. You're not allowed to travel because this is what the communists had ordered. But we were supposed to bring insulin to this little village up in the mountains and eyeglasses and stuff. And so we were feeling the sense of emergency to get there. So we packed this tiny little van with these little wheels and we drive up the mountain. And there were multiple times during these like tsunami rains just coming down that we went almost barreled over the Himalayas like, I think that's the closest I've ever come to dying. And it wouldn't have just been me, it would have been my wife and my brother-in-law and my brother and a couple people from the church but God spared us. And it was raining, and we, we ended up breaking down in the middle of nowhere, and then this pastor with a motorcycle, with like an off-road motorcycle, took us, you know, hiking up this mountain, and we went across that bridge, and then this light turned on, and it was this, like, really sweet resort that we stayed at called The Last Resort, and that's how we ended up, and that was the next day. And when we got there, all the dudes were, like, jumping up and down high fine because it was like we were in a fantasy novel, and all the girls went back to their, Hannah said, went back to their rooms and just started crying. <laughs> It was so stressful. It was very, it was very, um, we almost died, so. Yeah, she said it's very hard because we almost died. That's true. We did multiple times. Anyway, what you learn from trips like that, from these adventures, the, I, I, I don't think we've, I've ever been on a missionary trip that was, quote, unquote, unsuccessful. And the reason was because the organizations we went with focused on the, the culture of the group more than the goal of the trip. So the goal of the trip was very clear. In every case, there were things, supplies, or, or education, or other things we were supposed to do. But at the heart of it, every day, they always wanted every missionary to have quiet times in the morning for at least an hour. And then we had times of worship together. They made sure that we were friends with one another. They made sure that we learned the culture of the place we were in, language, and food rules, and hospitality rules. And, and gender rules and things like this, and that we abided by those as guests in a country. We had debriefs, we had rest. And so all I'm saying is the only way 
you thrive in chaos as an organization is by first building the culture before the goals and vision. Goals and vision are super important. We're going to get to that, but it's all about building the culture. If you want sustainable results, if you want people to come back, you have to build a culture. Look, everyone has a great vision. You can find the worst businesses and worst organizations in the world, and they're going to have an awesome mission statement. Try it out sometime. It's amazing. How consistently bad organizations have amazing mission statements and amazing visions. Uh, you can see uh, all sorts of places like that that, that, you know, that have these great vision statements. But at the end of the day, the greatest companies and the greatest organizations have a, a great, an obvious culture. You kind of get a feel for what it is. Maybe at the top of my list, and it's not just because their food is good, but is Chick-fil-A. And Chick-fil-A, everybody's like, if, if, if the government had given this whole thing to Chick-fil-A, the vac you know, it would be gone by now. The virus would be gone. Chick-fil-A, I had a friend that once said, you can know if somebody worked for Chick-fil-A by just saying thank you. No, you have to go to Chick-fil-A to get that joke. Everybody at Chick-fil-A always says, my pleasure. So Chick-fil-A or Disney, I mean, you go to Disneyland, an amazing culture. Now, I haven't worked there. I know a lot of people here do. But just as a visitor, it does seem like Disney has a clear-cut culture. I don't know what their vision statement or mission statement is. Maybe you do. But I do know that there's a way in which they think. Um, so many of these great companies, you can't say what their mission statement is, but you can clearly get a feel for what their culture is. Here was the Crystal Cathedral mission statement to inspire and motivate persons through possibility thinking to grow in a loving relationship with Jesus Christ so they can be the person God dreams, desires, and designed them to be. Isn't that wonderful? But when, I, when you look back at when the cathedral started... I don't know what the mission statement was back then, but they clearly had a culture of positivity, of friendliness, of big goals, of big dreams. And my point is simply this. Culture, this is my friend Sam Chan said this, culture eats vision for lunch. It's culture all the way. If you have a great culture in your family, in your church, in your business, you are going to see great results. So you have a family and an inner circle and you've got friends and you've got businesses and you've got places you, you if you want to have an impact, before you talk about what you want your family to accomplish or, or all these things, try and think about what kind of a family you want to become, what kind of kids you want to have, what kind of organization, what's, this, what's it going to be like for people, if you're a, like a middle manager, to come to your meetings or to come into your office? What kind of culture do you want to develop? And that's, a, that's the biggest question to ask. So when we lead like Jesus, one of the first things we have to say is developing people is just as big of an accomplishment as developing the vision. So developing people is just as big of a win as accomplishing the vision. Now, if you're hearing what I'm saying, you're, I was tempted to almost say, that developing people is more important than the vision, but what we'll see is that the vision helps develop people. But accomplishing the vision is more important than the... Uh, 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 developing people is just as big of an accomplishment as accomplishing the vision. Therefore, we not only want to develop people, but we also want to empower people to use the gifts that God has given them to make a difference in the world they've been called to have an impact in. So, for example, in Luke 9 and 10, Jesus gives his disciples all this power, tells them to go out with nothing, and says, don't even bring money, don't even bring an extra jacket, don't bring a sword, into a world where there's all sorts of hostility towards them. Just go and proclaim the kingdom of God and come back when your, your thing is accomplished. So we see this a lot, don't we, where in organizations and groups you have what the Lead Like Jesus Seminar calls the quack-quack model. So you have policies and things that are put in place which are good, but when something is so obviously should happen, but it doesn't happen because of bureaucracy, you get some person at a desk that says, I'm sorry, quack-quack. Our policy says quack-quack. All you have to do is go to the DMV or the post office, and you're going to get people who don't have a great culture that are just going to say quack-quack, quack-quack. 
right? Sorry if you work at the DMV or the post office. Post office is getting better, actually. But, but the opposite of that are people who are empowered to break the rules because they understand the big picture, a culture of people who understand where we're going. So Ken Blanchard uh, tells the story about when he went to Southwest Airlines and he'd forgotten his driver license. And so he arrives at the curbside thing, and this is pre-9-11, you know, and he, he arrives and he's got his bags and they want to check him in and give him his tickets. And he's like, oh no, I forgot my wallet. I don't have my driver's license. How am I going to get on this flight? And he says, can I ask you a question? I wrote this book with Don Shula, who's not related, by the way, but a famous coach. And Ken Blanchett and Don Shula are on the cover of the book. And he goes, can I use this as a form of ID? And the Southwest Airlines guy goes, you know Don Shula, this is you for sure, come with me. And he takes all of his stuff, walks him in, he's like, they might give you a hard time, I'm gonna help you. So he walks with the guy to the front desk, helps him get, it, helps him get it onto the plane. That is an airline that understands, has a core value, a core culture that was better than his competitors. And he says, when I was flying back on another airline, I tried the same thing because I still didn't have my wallet. And the guy at the curbside said, oh, I don't think you can use that quack quack. Let me ask my manager. And so he brings the manager over and the manager says, oh, our policies don't allow for that to happen quack quack. He says, we need to bring in a supervisor. And the supervisor says, quack quack. We've never seen anything like this before, quack quack. And so you see that the difference between you know, the cultures. For sure, Southwest probably had some policy in place, but the, the culture trumped, you know, whatever it was, the bureaucracy. In Luke, there's something like this that happens. So this happens a lot. But in Luke, there's the story where Jesus, in Judaism, in Jesus' day, the oral tradition is being developed. And so you have the Torah, which functions in Judaism as a core document of faith. And then you have the Tanakh, which are the other, includes the Torah and all of the other books. And this functions as a core, core rule for how to live as Jews in the first century and even today. And then around that comes this thing called the oral tradition where rabbis, teachers, and scribes are sort of trying to think of you know, other ways in which they might be at odds with one another and how to enforce it. So one of these oral tradition rules, you know, the, the Torah says you shouldn't work on a Sabbath. So one of the questions that comes up is, can we heal on the Sabbath? And some schools of rabbis said yes, and others said no. So when Jesus comes into a synagogue, there is a woman who is hunched over. She hasn't been able to walk for 18 years. And it, it, she comes into the synagogue on Sabbath, and Jesus heals her. And it's this incredible miracle. And it says that the synagogue leader who is surrounded by Pharisees and rabbis who are trying to work through this oral tradition, the synagogue leader comes forward and he says, now, now, I know she's been healed and I know this is an amazing miracle and we've all known Jane to be, you know, hunched over for 18 years and yes, it's lovely and all that, you know, she can walk now, but our tradition says, quack, quack, we don't heal on the Sabbath. That's not what we do. There are six days of the week Jesus has been here all week. She could have come here yesterday. He's going to be here tomorrow. She could have come tomorrow. But he didn't do any of those things. This is kind of the picture, right? He says, there's six days of the week. You're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath. And, and he looks back at, you know, the, these old guys, these old Pharisees who have written this. And he's like, right, guys? Like, yeah, that's, that's right. That's, that's exactly right. She should have come yesterday. She can come back tomorrow. Quack, quack. And so... And so uh, Jesus then says, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath day untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Now this is, a, this is called a mercy law. So part of the oral tradition said, on the Sabbath you're not allowed to work, but you can take your animals to water and to food. Why? Well, because part of the Torah is to treat animals with, with respect in a way. There's a right way to slaughter animals. There's a right way to care for animals. And so, so one of the rules is you don't want your... It's, it's horrible to let your poor donkey not drink water because you don't want to work. So you can take him to water, right? And then he said, that, so if that's true, then should not this woman 
a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? Do you hear what he's saying? You care more about your donkeys than you do about your children. You are saying, quack, 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 quack. At the end of the day, the culture trumps the bureaucracy. The culture even trumps the vision. It's the culture. It's the heart. Okay. So we have to empower people to break the rules sometimes. We do. And, uh, and that's important. I like to think, you know, that, that that's a key thing. Okay. Finally, number three, and I'll just finish with this. You know, I can't say that vision is not important because it is important. When you build the right culture and the right team, yes, having big goals is also important. If you build a big vision, the vision will build your team. That's really important. Again, I'm sorry to remind you that I enjoy video games. It's a downer for my family, my colleagues. But I do. And, uh, you know, there, there is something like what happens in video games when you face challenges, your characters typically get boons, you know, like special things, or they level up. And I think this is true for your team. If you don't have, if you're not leading your team through challenges, you're not seeing them develop. So like every challenge you face is an incredible time to develop the culture in your staff. Like COVID has been such a good time and season for us to focus on our culture because there's been so many challenges. Unpredictable challenges that no guidelines have been written for how to handle a global pandemic. I know it's impossible to believe that and no, but we have a culture for how to thrive in chaos. So it's been a great time. There is something about having a crystal clear vision and almost making sure that it's hard enough that there will be enough challenges along the way uh, to build your team. So, like, for example, I heard, I heard once a guy say, who had retired from the Navy after, I think it was Second World War, an old guy, and he said, you know, the reason I retired from the Navy after the war was over is, I hate to say this, but I liked wartime Navy more than, like, peacetime Navy, because peacetime Navy, we didn't know what to do with ourselves. We swabbed the deck, but in the war, there was a clear vision. Or in uh, Alice in Wonderland, there's this famous scene... There's this thing where Alice goes and there's a fork in the road and the Cheshire cat, she's asked the Cheshire cat, which way should I go? And he says to her, well, where do you want to go? And she says, well, I don't know. And then he says to her, then it doesn't matter which way you go. And that's true in life. Okay, all of this to simply say that what we leave, learn from the Lord is if you have an impact on just 12 people, if you're a parent, let this encourage you. If you don't travel a lot, let this encourage you. All you have to do is impact 12 people and create a deep enough culture in their heart that will live after you to change the whole world. You don't have to write any books. You don't have to have big crowds. You don't have to be famous. But if you invest in a handful of people, you can see how generations later, investing in a culture of someone will, will make all the difference in the world. And so very often in our sort of ego-driven world, it can feel sometimes like, I'm not doing much with my life. I don't have a lot of things I can look to. But I want to encourage you that if you, if you uh, continue to, to, to invest in people, that's going to be a much bigger impact than a lot of the other things. And, and God will get you there. You know, if you, if you have a big dream, I believe God will get you to your dream. But first he wants to build you and build your team, and then you'll get where you need to go. Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit. And I just pray, God, that you continue to draw us to you, Father. Continue to build inside of us your life, your goodness, and help us, Lord, to, to grow and to be more like Christ. Help us to be dynamic leaders who focus on people. Lord, we love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Hannah and I are so happy that you've joined us in worship today, and we hope that you found incredible hope and inspiration from this program. Several years ago, I began practicing the Creed of the Beloved by saying it aloud each day, and now it's become a vital part of the walk that I have with the Lord. Though simple, these words have changed me from the inside out and given me renewed vision, joy, and energy. Every week on Our Power, we recite the Creed, which says, I'm not what I do, I'm not what I have, I'm not what people say about me, I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it away from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. And that's the truth, dear friend. By resting in the Lord's boundless and unconditional love, you will experience the fullness of his blessings. When you embrace your position as his beloved child, you will be empowered to step into your true identity, to be courageous, to take risks, and to follow his call on your life. Though it's not magic, practicing this creed changed the dial on my life one degree at a time. Well, I didn't notice like a huge difference at first, as I regularly trained and aligned my mind with the Word of God, I developed a deep sense of rootedness and contentment. And I believe this can happen to you too. As a daily reminder of who you are in Christ, we wanna send you this Creed of the Beloved bookmark. As you meditate on the truths it contains, we believe it has the potential to transform your life from the inside out. Write to Hour of Power, New Zealand, P.O. Box 26209, Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. You can tap into the energy, power, and joy that comes from living in the kingdom of God when you walk every day in your identity as His beloved. As always, we're extremely grateful for your friendship and we're continually praying for you. God loves you and so do we.